Who fights destructive fires like this in Iowa? It's 25,000 firefighters, mostly volunteers, who protect Iowa communities in this hazardous job. Learn why they serve and how they get training for safe and effective firefighting. And watch them having fun while they learn. Don't miss extension reports on the volunteer firefighter. Who fights destructive fire like this in Iowa? Mostly volunteer firefighters. And why do they risk their necks in one of the most hazardous of all jobs? I think it's like a lot of things. It gets in your blood, and you just it's just something that you like. It's exciting, and it gives me a chance to do something for the community that I'm trained to do, that I know how to do, and that is needed. And to me, that's important. Well, my grandfather was fire chief. My father was fire chief when I was born. So as soon as I got old enough to put my name in the fire department, I did. Firefighting, it gets in your blood. It's exciting. It runs in the family. It's something I can do for the community. Reasons for being a volunteer firefighter. And of the 925 fire departments in Iowa, 900 of them are made up of volunteers, says Roger Sweet, instructor for fire service extension. Primarily the difference between the volunteer and paid in the towns is the number of calls and probably the number of alarms per year, or per week, whatever time frame. And it gets to a point where the volunteer is the economical way to go because you're not paying salaries. Our uh, approximate uh, budget uh, and expenditures for fire service and our volunteer system is about $100,000 annually. Uh, it fluctuates with the purchase of equipment, etc. I know that, uh, that uh, to go to a, to a full-time fire service would entail at least a five hundred to six hundred thousand dollars. But there gets to be a point where there are so many alarms per day that the volunteers cannot afford to take that much time off work, whether they're paid for it or whether they're not paid for it. And it almost mandates having a paid service, which includes full paid personnel on duty, 24 hours a day to handle the calls. So we have a mix in Iowa from the pure volunteer to the pure paid with all combinations in between with some paid drivers and volunteers, paid chiefs and volunteers, true volunteers and full paids. In the Des Moines area, for example, volunteers serve much of the Des Moines metro area. Our department consists of, uh, of uh, 50 in personnel. We do now have a full-time fire chief only. The rest of the personnel on the department are, are volunteer. City officials know full and well by looking at the budget that if they do not have to pay the salary and can get by and have the volunteers the low enough calls, number of calls per year, that they can get by with volunteers, it's economically feasible for them because they can actually buy additional equipment. They can have really better equipment in many cases, more modern equipment. We try to probably go a, a little more extensively on, on uh, expens expenditure of equipment because we want these people to have the best to, to work with. But um, having a total volunteer fire department, we keep down tremendously on salary cost and still have very capable people to fight our fires for us. By far, the majority of the state is volunteer, uh, with only the large metropolitan areas being paid. We receive no compensation uh, from the city or from the rural. It's strictly volunteer on a volunteer basis, uh, the membership buys their own, uh, well, like this jacket that I'm wearing, they buy that. Uh, we are furnished with protective clothing and all the necessary items that are needed in fighting fires. We are provided by the city with them. We do have the steak dinner once a year and a free Pepsi after the fire. <laughs> Other than that, it's totally volunteer. And if you consider uh, the gas you spend driving to and from the fire station and possibly a ruined pair of pants now and then. It usually costs in dollars and cents uh, over any period of time. Uh, some departments today, to join the department, you still must pay a fee to join the department. It's an honor and 
some cases uh, it replaces the social club in some towns. So therefore there are annual dues to some of the fire departments even in the state of Iowa today. Even so, many departments have waiting lists. We have a waiting list. Uh, as I mentioned, there are 32 members and it's all volunteer, but uh, uh, with no pay you might think that uh, it, it might be difficult to get members. However, the, the opposite is, is, very, is, is the truth. We have a waiting list of members right now, probably, I don't know exactly, but I would just guess six or eight people. And some of them have been on for the waiting list for six or eight months. And will probably be on, uh, matter of fact, for six or eight more months, as a matter of fact. Communities are proud of their firefighters, too. And we can go to many of the towns in the state of Iowa and find this, almost every town and find the community support behind the volunteer fire departments. Well, I think it's part of my duty as an employer uh, to give Dennis the free time that he needs to, to fight the fires. I think each and every one of us owe that to our community. Any way that we might help out is helping everybody in general. I've seen Denny excuse himself in the middle of a sale. I hope he's never lost a sale from it, but possibly he has, but he's gotten up in the middle of a sale and, and, and he's left and he's gone and fought the fire. I think people understand that. The Belmont Fire Chief gives another example of community support. Uh, we're very fortunate in uh, Belmont, in our fire department, that uh, we have good support from the rural population. Uh, the uh, uh, problem we have with the rural is a lack of water. And uh, we're fortunate in that uh, various farmers in the area uh, have uh, water tanks that they use in their farm operation that uh, they have made available to us. And all we have to do is call them and uh, they'll come wherever we want them, anytime we want them. Good service wins support for the fire department. We've had a small picker fire a few years ago, and it, they just responded excellently. Uh, just a matter of minutes, and they were here. Okay, from the time that uh, our alerting system goes off, uh, we have a siren alert and a telephone alert, but from the time that goes off, uh, anywhere from a, a minute to a minute and a half, and the uh, engines are rolling. A banker from Council Bluff supports his firefighter employee. We try and encourage all our people to be active in United Fund, firefighting, anything that's uh, civically oriented. They understand the situation with volunteer departments. They f allow me to go. They have no reservations about it. I also live in the country, so I have a very definite personal interest as well as a community and civic interest in this thing. We've had a lot of fire. We lost our place totally, but that was before volunteer firemen, so we can attest to the fact that they're well worth their salt in every way, shape, or form. Let's ask a longtime firefighter about his early work. I joined the fire department on November 7, 1922. The training men was more or less putting up ladders and using axes to rip off cedar shingles and, and try to stop the fire. We didn't go on the farm in those days. We didn't have the equipment to answer farm fires right at all. <coughs> Later we did. And it's always been my ambition to improve our fire, not only our own fire department, but all fire departments. And as soon as the fire school got started at Ames, why, I attended the first one and have never missed a fire school since it started. <coughs> 54 years of it. <laughs> Our first state fire school was held in 1924. And it was sponsored by or requested by, at that time, the Iowa Fo Firemen's Association. When the Iowa Firemen's Association came to the university and asked if um, the university could help the individual departments with training and education problems. And so in 1924, they started the first annual state fire school. And the state fire schools have been held at Iowa State or in Iowa every year since. It's a four-day school now, and we have over a 1,000 firefighters attending every year. So it's becoming quite a, quite a traditional thing. But we had our 54th school this year, and we happen to be the oldest continuous training program in this nation. We'll have over 10 classes per year, 
and the individuals can go to any one of those 10 that they want to, depending on the subject area. Uh, for instance, the flammable liquid class, which is a very popular class every year. But this is one of the things that most uh, fire departments don't have available to them, is a flammable liquid pit, so primarily this is where most of them get it, right here in the state, is right here at fire service training, at fire school. When Mr. Simmons put me as lead on the nozzle, we went into the first bulk plant that they set up, and they flooded a pond full of water and then put all sorts of flammable liquids in it, and they had several cylinders and things to simulate what would be in a bulk plant type system. And there was, I believe, five direct attack lines, and we all had to attack at one time and try and sweep the flames back off of the water into an area behind the tanks so that we could drive them together and put them out. Uh, I would say rescue is a popular subject every year. Even though one year it may be talking about one thing, another year another. They may talk about uh, entry into cars one year and rescue from heights another. What we're getting into in more of your small town departments is extrication, getting victims out of a trap vehicle. It's a tool they can use to cut the car apart and just cut the... What they do, they cut the car away from the victim. I take vacation to do this. Uh, so that's the only way I can get off is take vacation. But that's, you know, that's just part of it. If you enjoy what you're doing, why well, you use some of your vacation to do it. Yeah, but most of the guys do take vacation to come here. Okay, some of the, when they go to a fire school and they see a new piece of equipment and they say, hey, that's just too expensive for us, but it's a good idea. Trainer volunteers got the ideas for making a special services truck at the school. Uh, we put it in operation probably four or five years ago, and it's just been continually adding to and helping build it since then. We probably have close to $4,000 total uh, in the truck. It includes a radio overhauling the engine and all the air pack equipment, uh, ventilation fans, generators, porta power equipment, so forth. If you started new, it would probably run from fifteen dollars to $20,000. Many ideas from the school are taken back to provide training for those who couldn't come. One of the popular ones is the breathing apparatus most of the towns have breathing apparatus. It's a new, relatively new game. Uh, more fire departments are getting breathing apparatus now than ever before. And so it's a big training function to teach search and rescue. Uh, without breathing apparatus, they weren't able to go in to a, an atmosphere that was not inhabitable by man. But now with breathing apparatus, they can go into a building and find people that are trapped in smoke-filled buildings. And this is probably an exercise that is practiced more than any of them. Uh, they have the bags over their head because uh, normally you don't see when you're in working. Now the fellows are in and they're, they're working in, they're working a search pattern to the right. They're using the nozzle for a safety line. Uh, there would be a man at the door keeping the line in and tight for any signals to come back. They use their hands, their feet, and spread out. Then they follow the line out. Your communications is real important. Supervisor of Fire Service Extension, Keith Royer, agrees that radio communication is important. Well, we have estimated that communications equipment on fire apparatus and in the hands of firefighters increases their efficiency by over 50%. Simply by having, being able to get the right things at the right place at the right times. Without communications, why, uh, you're, you're totally at a total loss, really. I, you know, I've often wondered how some departments get along without any type of radio communications at all, especially when you're responding to the scene of the fire or any emergency. Each one of our firemen carries a, a, a page. And when we have a fire, the page system is activated, and each fireman is notified through page that Over that page, the location is given, and that fire fireman can respond immediately to the fire. Should we have a, uh, an extensive fire that need, we need outside help, we'll call for them, and, and uh, we, we get their assistance immediately. 
I might say that with this type of a program, we feel that within a very short time, we can have a large amount of equipment uh, at a fire in our city or any city that belongs to the mutual aid program. It takes planning to have a radio system that helps fire departments work together. In Marshall County, the planning started 20 years ago. The chiefs that were within the county at that time were, I guess you'd have to say, visionary because uh, they saw the need in it. Uh, they were fortunate enough that uh, Bill Nelson from Iowa State University Fire Service Extension uh, come over and pointed out the fact that if we were going to set up a system, it would be best if we set up a county-wide system. And thank God they all did it because uh, throughout the last 20 years, why uh, I think this has probably helped tie the county together. I think there's only about a half a dozen counties or so that does not have fire communication systems that are tie all tied in to this coordinated statewide fire net. Thus, the departments can use radios to effectively fight fires together, but it takes coordinated training. We'll find how this training has improved and how it affects your insurance rates when we return. Fires do happen in public buildings. Your survival might depend on knowing something about fire and how it reacts. When we're talking about fire, of course, we could talk about the chemistry of fire, and that's how fuel and heat and oxygen unite. But people are really more concerned about how that fire is going to behave in a building. What is that fire going to do? And if people can learn a little bit about how fire will behave and how to predict that behavior, they can go a long ways towards helping themselves survive. Some of the key points to remember, and the first one will seem very elemental, but it's very important. That's that heat rises. When a fire burns, of course, it produces large amounts of heat, and that heat will rise, and it will go first to the ceiling level. Now, that has some very important implications. We want to be below the heat because the heat will sear our lungs and make it so we can't breathe. In, in addition to that, the heated gases contain toxic chemicals which can render us immobile, which can uh, mix us up, confuse us, and we don't know where we are. So we want to stay down low, and that means we may even need to crawl or get on our stomachs and really slither out in order to avoid the heated, toxic gases that, that are at sitting level. Fires can happen to you. For further information on being ready to deal with fire, contact your local extension office. Training for firefighters occurs at a lot of times and places. Sometimes it's fun. Then one of the other things that has become a big thing at the State Fair is the water fights. And our water fights uh, consist of a barrel hanging from a cable. And the firefighters have teams and competition and with a stream of water try to push the barrel to the other end. And the public many times looks at the State Fair and the activities as fun and games. And granted, the guys are having fun. Take their own time and their own money to come down here to be in the fights. They bring their families with them. Uh, it's a family uh, outing, you might say, for these people. But the practice and the training that they go into to get ready for it is of tremendous value to the general public. The next time you call them, they'll know a little bit better about what's going on and how to do it. Training through contest is also a part of the Firemen's Convention. The Iowa Firemen's Association had their 100th convention this year. The organization is 10,000 strong, and they have an annual convention. Iowa has a statewide program to guide training for firefighters. Here's how it works. But we at Iowa State try to coordinate and supervise the total training of all the firefighters in the state. Uh, we do not actually do the training in most of the cases, but we try to coordinate it and make sure that we can get someone to the job to satisfy the needs of that particular department. We have about two hours to two and a half hours of training before our business meeting every month. Uh, we train on things as such as ladders, the operation of pumps, uh, this type of thing. Well, it's given us a great deal of confidence in some situations that we might get into by knowing how to take care of ourselves in a dangerous situation. To coordinate the training for 900 fire departments takes planning. When I first started in this field uh, about 30 years ago uh, down in the state of Kansas, I recognized very quickly that it was not possible to carry out a comprehensive educational program at local level 
with a central staff as such to get to those 900 departments, it, it just, the numbers get you down too quickly. So in 1967, when the Iowa uh, General Assembly passed the legislation creating the area school system, and we set out right at that time before the area schools even came into existence, you know, physically, to um, how could we utilize this new educational resource to achieve the fire service objectives, educational objectives. And uh, that planning really has paid big dividends. We utilize the area community college system in the state of Iowa as a tremendous resource for funding, for personnel, and for communications. The fire departments actually pay for this training to have an instructor come out to their town. 21 part-time field coordinators are the link in the training system across the state. Well, basically, we are in contact with the uh, fire departments and uh, setting up their uh, training program for the basic fire training. Yes, we have many cooperative uh, programs uh, in our division, but we look upon this particular program with the, with the fire service uh, of Iowa State University as probably one of the uh, most compatible and, and uh, uh, effective programs that we have. Up until now, if you were on a fire department, everyone assumed that you were an excellent firefighter. And we don't like to admit it, but once in a while we don't have excellent firefighters all the way around. So we have a training program and a set of standards. And the standards are going to be for Firefighter 1, 2, and 3. And we're just instituting this program. It's been in existence about seven years now. And the firefighters themselves can go to school, can take the training. It's a voluntary basis, 100% voluntary. We have nine members on this department who are Firefighter 1s. I have worked the night shift at the post office up until this last summer, and I wasn't able to take the courses, but uh, as of now, I've already completed four of the courses. I've learned a great deal in the last four months in these training classes that we've been taking. The instructors in our firefighter certification program are primarily from local fire departments. Uh, most of them are volunteers because, of course, we have more volunteer departments in the state. Uh, several are paid departments from the larger cities and they work with their area school people to deliver the instruction to the individual departments. Several steps are required for an individual to be certified as an instructor. Uh, you have schooling you have to go to, and it consists of two weekends, 10 hours a day, and then you uh, take a written exam, have to pass it with a certain qualification, then you have to teach in three towns, different towns, and call back to one of them then be accepted by the Instructor Society for your certification. Programs such as certification have long been supported by insurance companies. The insurance companies played a big part in the fire service because people knew they needed insurance, and then the insurance companies would be able to say, OK, if the fire department has this, this, and this, they will give different rates. Because the insurance companies are involved, their employees often work with the fire service. I've been teaching, I guess, the last, uh, what, five years? The flammable liquids classes up at Iowa State. And I think between uh, myself and four of my engineers, we did something in excess of 50 county meetings last year. Ruby and his engineers have developed a number of training aids, including this grain dust explosion simulator. And today, the insurance companies are looking at the amount of training that they have. So. Therefore, our function relates to the insurance companies, which relates to the homeowner and the businessman in reducing premiums. We have departments that really do not train and do not have sufficient training, and therefore the insurance companies will not insure the larger properties in that town. And in my own company, I can tell you that we have been the subject of suits now, alleging malpractice on the part of the fire department. And in my opinion, there are several of those that we are just plain going to lose. There are a lot of chiefs and a lot of departments, and there are a lot of city councils that have not thought through this question of there now being liability for their activities. And it may take a dandy suit somewhere to wake them all up. And 
I don't know that there's a way around it until you get everyone involved in these nationally recognized certification programs. I would say there are only half a dozen states that are anywhere near as involved in this program as Iowa is. A vice president of the Iowa Firemen's Association notes how training has improved his department since he joined. When I first came on, why, about all they knew was to go out to a fire and start throwing water on it. And today they go in the house, you know, they go into the building and they go to the fire. And you're finding a lot less damage than you used to 19 years ago. Uh, I think the departments now are doing a much better job of fighting fires than they ever did before. My personal feeling on training is that it's only hurting myself by not going to these meetings. You learn things there that help you put out fires, uh, teach you safety, and uh, the way fires act. And you're going to prevent yourself from being hurt or prevent others from being hurt and save more property and possibly lives by knowing the, the right things to do in fire situation. I think one of the things that many people don't realize is that for every hour on the fire ground, there's probably a couple of hours that men have spent in training and maintenance that uh, uh, doesn't always show uh, when you see them at the fire, but this time is away from their families and really the whole family is sacrificing in uh, allowing this man to, uh, to be part of the department. Even though serving takes lots of time, Families support their firefighters. I'm for it, really, because um, as small a community as we live in, we went into it together. I mean, it was he told me that, you know, he felt that he wanted to do it, and we, we just did it together. And so I feel that the time that he spends away is not taking away from us. It's, it's really learning for us. My family uh, would probably disown me if I ever quit the fire service. They're, my children and my wife are quite happy that I'm in it. They get pretty well involved themselves. They enjoy it. They enjoy being a part of the fire department. And the firefighters in your community, do you know them and why they joined? Yeah, it's been kind of interesting, the reaction from the church board, since I went on the fire department. Two of the members of my church board who also live in Hiawatha have joined the department. Well, here in Trainer, <clears throat> the fire whistle blows, we just, I just drop everything and run. Just leave the shop wide open. And leave, leave the customer sitting there. Or if he has to be a fireman, he's taking off running the same as I am. I think basic to, to most people when they start out as a volunteer uh, has to be in the back of their mind. It could be my house, could be my family, uh, it could be my neighbor's house. Uh, uh, the idea of preparing for, for a, a very real danger that might affect my own surroundings. And, and you really uh, say to yourself, why would these guys come out and do this while their neighbors are sitting home watching TV, watching the football game and so forth? And I think sometimes you just have to marvel at, at uh, what generosity there is in some people that they'll give as much of their time and energy to do things that need to be done uh, to help their fellow man. And I think uh, uh, sometimes it goes unappreciated by some of those who would complain the most if it wasn't available.